and welcome back to episode two of Lose Your Mind. I'm Kelly and today I'm joined by my co-host Alan. Hello, hello again. Alan. Oh, hello. hello. Sorry, I jumped the gun there, Kelly. I do apologise. No problem at all. How are you today? Yeah, I'm doing all right, thanks. I've had a nice game of golf this morning and got some fresh air and some exercise. So yeah, I feel all is well with the world. Brilliant. A good start to the day. Well, if it's okay with you, I'm going to ask you a few questions about yourself and your journey with mindfulness, if you're happy to oblige. That would be brilliant, yeah. Looking forward. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. So starting off then, Alan, tell us a bit about yourself. Who are you and how you got into mindfulness and meditation? Gosh, so I'm Alan and uh, I am... 53 years old and uh, I come originally from the northwest of England but I live now in uh, Worcestershire and um, I've been practicing mindfulness for I want to say about eight or nine years now and I've been a mindfulness teacher for four years just coming up to four years so how did I start did you ask I'm sorry yes I did yeah so how did you get into mindfulness and how did I Okay, well, it started, I was, um, we were living in Canada at the time, my wife and I, and um, I was in a job that I always really wanted, okay, so I was working for Cadbury, the global company Cadbury over in Canada, and uh, I had a job, I was a customer service director, and I'd wanted this job for ages, and uh, when I got it, I realized it was probably too big for me. I had a big, really big team and it was just a time when the company had just been through a lot of changes. We had lots of stock problems, customers screaming at me, sales screaming at me. And uh, I just, just let it all get on top of me really. And I didn't look after myself very well. So I started to not sleep, um, which was the start of the problem. So I remember it very well. One Monday night, waking up one Monday morning, I should say, waking up two o'clock in the morning, bolt upright in a in a flat panic about the following day and the things I had to do and um it just sort of rolled from there really and once I got into that spiral I I just started to feel a bit blue and down and I just long story short I googled it as to what I could do about it and I came across mindful meditation and uh, and that's how I that's how I started and I did an online course just watching some guy on videos just doing meditations and yeah I, I really enjoyed it got into it really quickly actually um, and found some benefits really quickly which is what hooked me in you know yeah oh that's nice to hear I mean it's I think a lot of people can probably relate to what you're saying there about being under a lot of pressure in a high-powered job and then struggling with sleep and all things like that I know I've certainly been there did you notice the difference straight away or did it take you a while to realize the benefits of the mindfulness of meditation i would say it sort of gathered momentum over time so i found very quickly that um when i was it didn't solve my sleep straight away but it solved a lot of my daily calmness so i remember the feeling of going into work and having much more mental clarity um so i just felt i just felt like the world had slowed down a bit you know, rather than it kind of rushing past me, I just thought, actually, it's just slowed down and given me that little bit of time to think um, and also just make more rational decisions. I remember at the time, it was quite a high octane, macho environment as well. And it felt like if you weren't running around with your hair on fire and shouting at people and swearing a lot, you know, it felt like you weren't doing your job. And I suddenly thought, well, Actually, no, I don't feel like I need to do that. I feel like I can be calm. And that calmness rubs off on others as well. And you, I saw that in others, that they started to be a lot happier around me, you know, particularly at work and at, and at home as well, I think. So, so yeah, it, but it gathers, it gathers pace, I think, you know, but you do get something quite quickly. Um, yeah and do you feel by seeing that that sort of ripple effect that calmness in others around you was part of the reason and part of the passion that led you into actually teaching mindfulness and meditation yourself 
Well, I never really thought about it until um, it was my yoga teacher. I got into yoga. So this after we came back to the UK. So this was probably two years later. I'd been into mindfulness for a couple of years. Came back home to the UK, got into yoga. And then my yoga teacher said, we were just talking about mindfulness one day. And he said, have you, have you ever thought about teaching others? As it turned out, he, he was running a course. So he said, why don't you enroll? So I was like, oh, I know. It's a bit of a sales pitch. But I decided, I just thought, well, actually, why not? Um, and so I went on this um, teacher training course, same one as you, Kelly, Mindfulness Now, which we obviously highly recommend. And okay. uh, indeed. And I really, I loved it. It was just that they were, it was the fun, most fun training course I've ever been on. I don't know about you, because you just sit basically around and meditate the whole time and you just come out of there feeling, you know, on cloud nine. Um, and then I, I started practicing at work um, and just ran free drop-in sessions for people. And um, yeah, so that that's how it all started. And I, I do, I do get a real pleasure out of seeing others get benefit from it. Otherwise I wouldn't do it to be honest. No, and I think that's that's a really huge part of what makes you really authentic in your practice and people wanting to come and learn from you because if you believe in something, people feel that, don't they? Yeah, I I'll totally agree. I mean, it, it was the first time in my adult life that I'd found something that I actually thought, I, you know, I think I'm actually quite good at this and I do feel really good about it. And then somebody said to me one day, you know, you should make this your, this is your vocation. This is your calling. And I thought, yeah, okay then. And it's just nice to hear somebody else say that. So it's not just, you know, a story you're telling yourself in your own head, you know, and trying to con yourself into thinking you're good at something when you're not. But um, yeah, no, it seems to, seems to work out. I still enjoy it um, oh, and use it in all aspects of, of, of my job now if I can call it that which well, I'm sure we'll go into so we will just quickly coming back to something you said there actually yeah. Alan um with saying um how you felt with someone else saying to you that you were good at that and you felt that this is what you're meant to do you're calling I too as you know had a similar sort of experience but that self-belief um I don't know about you but people struggle with that don't they people struggle with belief in themselves all the time yeah and I feel the simple act of practicing and sharing that with others it does it does boost your self-esteem and the confidence and almost suppress those sort of fears and concerns enabling that to come out would you agree I would and I know I know you're you know we've talked a lot about your own self-esteem and confidence and how it's really helped you um I don't know whether it's a confidence thing for me or just a just a calming um uh, i mean uh, yeah i've i've like everybody else i've had imposter syndrome a lot you know in jobs that i've done and i and you always think oh i'm just not good enough to be here and even though they've given you the job so they must think that you know they must think you're good enough to do it um but it's not so much the confidence although there is something in that for me but it's more about calming me down and putting things into perspective and maybe the two things just kind of overlap really because you can get yourself in a tears can't you by things seeming bigger than they are if that makes sense yeah no definitely um yeah and then when you see the reality of what's happening it sometimes just makes it all easier somehow but yeah and when you think about mindfulness in itself what does that mean to you that's a that's a great question. Um, I should have an answer right off the bat, uh, but I think it, it tends to mean different things at different times to me, and I think things change as you go through different moods and stages. Um, I think it means <laughs> having the quietness of mind to be able to be calm and see the reality of any given situation i like that i yeah, yeah. i would agree yeah i better write I that down that. before i forget it <laughs>
but um, no that's very good but it's, it's so beneficial isn't it to most people which has led you to teaching yeah um and t- tell us a bit about what you teach and what you offer to others what what do you cover in, in your own company Alan I um so I got two businesses now that sounds so very grand I never thought I'd ever say that so one is just a private practice which um has been developing over the last two or three years since I gave up my full-time job at Cadbury um and I reached that you know midlife stage I think right now's the time or I'm never going to do it so which is uh, a mindfulness based and also hypnotherapy based so I'm a hypnotherapist although I don't do an awful lot of hypnotherapy at the moment and that's just the way it's been through covid really uh, so i do mindfulness one on one coaching so using mindfulness to help people get over any problem you know most psychological problems um because i think i think mindfulness is very helpful for an awful lot of things and then i do group classes and um i also run retreat days as well and also occasionally I do run different courses, which are mindfulness based usually. So it doesn't have to be necessarily be about mindfulness, but say it's about resilience or it's about how you form, you know, good habits and get rid of bad habits and try and give that a mindfulness angle. Cause I think the mindfulness is so valuable at getting people to check in on themselves with the self-awareness of the kind of things that they really want to be doing and getting in touch with themselves and what they want. So there's that. And then I, uh, I co-own a company um, with an old colleague of mine. Um, and we, we both had our mental health issues, you know, like I mentioned before, he's had similar things and we set up a company to do some mental health resilience training in companies like the ones we used to work in. So that's kicked off this year and that's, that's going quite well. So, and there's a mind, there's a mindfulness segment to that, which I, I run. You know, so so I like doing that. So I've I've got mindfulness running through everything I do, really. That's brilliant. So there's a huge need for things like that, personally and in companies um, worldwide, isn't there? So the fact that yeah. there are more resources yeah. and more people out there offering these services can only but be but nothing but beneficial. I would think. Yeah, there's a huge demand for it. It's it's the uh, I think as you know, the problems are connecting what we supply to what people actually think they need (laughs) if that makes sense i think there's an awful lot of people that do need it but they don't know they need it or haven't even thought of it so you know the marketing can be quite tricky um anyway that's 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 all that's a subject for another day probably but um yeah no you're right there's so much need for it and the other thing is you know with companies uh they they know they need to look after the people, um, but putting the money up front for it is another matter because everybody's under pressure right now. Yeah, I know it is a shame. It is getting that message out there to people. And like you say, some people don't think they need it, but they may want it. And I think as well, quite a lot of the time, people quite like being under pressure as a sort of a safety mechanism. They like having things to do. They yeah. think that, that that's the way to keep going. That's the way that things should be. But really, when you do actually start slowing down and just taking in the day by day, which opens up a world of opportunity, it is quite a scary thing, change, isn't it? It's the change, I think, that people fear. That is, yeah, that's so bang on because, I mean, so when in the hypnotherapy I do, you know, it's 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 all about a change of state. And it's the same with mindfulness. You're trying to change a state. Um, and with hypnotherapy, it's, it's usually a bit more extreme. You know, you've gone from a position of anxiety to wanting to be full of confidence. And actually, people hang on to their anxiety because it's a, it serves them in some way. So if somebody's got a social anxiety, they don't want to, they don't want to go out and socialize. It's a protection mechanism. Yeah, exactly. You know, and they're terrified of changing, you know. I know so, it's such a strange, strange thing, isn't it? Really, because in a in a natural tragedy, if there was a fire in in a in a building, who, whoever is facing that that situation, they would naturally come back to the present moment, so they could act in their best interest. Everything else usually would go, so they're focused in that situation, which is what our bodies tell us to do. But 
we let ourselves get so clouded up but the the slowing down is where the answers are so it is a shame like you say just getting that message out there um but in time I'm sure there there'll be more people that take it up and like we touched on last time you said men obviously don't like facing this kind of thing do they or think meditation isn't you know the right thing for them and it's just difficult to- yeah it is I mean it's always this I think for every 15 women that I see there's one guy you know and it's that can't be the way it should be that's just the way that that a lot of men think about it um and I think the other the other the thing I try and get across to people and I was running one of those mental health resilience courses the other day um I did a we did a mindful meditation on it and I asked them for feedback at the end of it and there was this guy who was just sat there just said not my cup of tea and and uh, I had a little joke with him because I said, yeah, kind of knew that, you know, sort of from what he'd said to me, I, I I knew that he would he would not be comfortable with it. But I what I did say was, look, you know, a lot of people get put off mindfulness by the fact that we call it meditation. And so so if I were to say to you, instead of you're going to meditate for five minutes, if you were to just sit down and be alone with your thoughts and relate to them in a healthy way you know, and sort your thoughts out, that'd be different, wouldn't it? You know, so maybe the word meditation, which is obviously still very, you know, central to mindfulness is still a barrier word. I wish, I wish we could come up with a new word for it. That would be the killer thing. You know, the, 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 the absolute thing that would make people want to do it. Yeah, I I agree. It's, It's a bit how we've called this podcast, lose your mind. People, sometimes like the idea of losing their mind and may think that relates to all sorts of things to get them to that place but what we mean by lose your mind is to actually check in with yourself and come out of your head so that you can see a bit of what's right here right now and it's just it's just getting that message across isn't it it is and uh, and for some and for some people that they won't ever get it and and that's fine that's fine it's not like we are saying it has to be for everybody um, there are different different ways to, you know, achieve your mental health goals and, and well-being. But, um, yeah, yeah it, it's just it's unfortunate that I think people are missing out. I agree. So, Alan, tell us what's next for you. What else have you got going on in the background? Where do you aspire to be this time next year? Is there anything else on the horizon that you're planning to do with your teaching or any other interests you may have? Um. Well, if I could wave a magic wand, I'd love to use uh, mindfulness within a, a sporting context. So to work oh, with, expand. to work with it, yeah, work with a team. But unfortunately, you know, these professional teams tend to have a, you know, a professional psychologist. And I'm not, I'm not a professional psychologist. You know, I don't have a psychology degree or anything like that. You know, I came into this through my own personal experience and then got some qualifications. But, you know, so but I I would really like to be a coach for someone because, I, you know, I use mindfulness when I play golf. Now, I don't I don't think you play golf, do you, Kelly? We probably would have talked about that before now. Yeah, no, I I have played a very, very minimal amount. But my dad is quite a good golfer. Is he? Him and I together and him trying to teach me is not a good mix, I tell you. Uh, (laughs) Well, yeah, I didn't know that. But that's, how, what, how good is he then? Do you know? Do you know what his handicap is? I don't. I don't off the top of my head, but I'll get back to you. On that <laughs> no, one. Don't worry. Don't worry. <laughs> but it's because um, the professionals know. You know, have psychologists, and they have. You know, and they they do all their mental exercises. Golfers who are kind of mid range, there's an awful lot they can do with their game because they haven't sorted their head out, and it's. And it's not necessarily psychology. It's just the fact that you, when you approach the ball to hit it, and this is kind of, I I think of this as a metaphor for life because you stand over the ball and rather than just go through the joy of swinging the golf club to hit the ball, you're thinking, oh, I really must hit this well because if I don't hit this well, I won't score well and I'm going to lose the game, blah, 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 blah. And you've invented this story all in your head of what's going to happen. You can't control the outcome. You can only control the input of it 
And it's going to be a lot better if you can just take a deep breath, relax your muscles and swing the golf club. So I try and take that approach with me and it's made my game a lot better. So if I can help, if I can help other people do that, um, yeah, that'd be a really fun thing to do. So I think what I'd quite like to do is go down to the local club um, and have a chat with the professional and say, what do you think about this? You know, maybe run a free seminar, you know, maybe do some one-to-one coaching and then see how it goes, you know. But that's probably a bit of a pipe dream. I think what I'm going to do is expand uh, the community that I have, expand the one-to-one stuff. Uh, I need to expand the uh, company work that I do as well. Um, and also just like to run some more courses, you know, so, um, you know, which is like a finite amount of time. People come along and really learn something really valuable that they can take away and use forever and not just, oh, I went on that course once and I did that. You know, I've got a real thing that that they need to go on it and really take it with them and it's part of their DNA. I, I agree. I think that is wonderful. And I think there is nothing better than that feeling when you've worked with someone and they they're a bit resistant they don't really like it they don't understand it and then at the end of it I found with people I've taught the change is just it's just an amazing thing to see that weight lifted and someone really just connect it and they they get it they can see the purpose it's amazing and I don't think that that should be out of your remit you know you could uh England football team here you come (laughs) yeah that's right yeah wouldn't that be great (laughs) Um, yeah, I would like to do that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it would be fun, wouldn't it? And you'd, yeah, I mean, it's tremendously satisfying to just see a team performing or an individual at their very best because they've managed to just knock over all the barriers that are getting in their way mentally, which, you know, like I said, you know, that's why I think it's a good metaphor for life as well, because life's like that. I agree. And I think it's like that Houdini story, you know, where the only limits are in your mind and I just think that's just a I love that story so much and I just think it's true maybe you should tell that tell that story for the the listeners Kelly okay I'll try and remember it the best I can (laughs) no pressure on or we can leave a link to it at the bottom of this yes whichever way you want to do it it. well I'll I'll give you a quick run through so Houdini the uh, grandmaster magician as everyone knows is in a village of a local prison. This, don't quote me on accuracy, anyone for listening, but this is a rough idea. And he goes to the local village and there's the prison and he challenges everyone that he can break out of the jail cell in about a minute's time um, using his belt and he can get out of anything, anything possible. So they say, okay, he's taken into the cell The door is shut firmly behind him. He takes off his belt and he starts working on the lock to try and break out of the cell. And after a couple of minutes, he's drenched in sweat. He's all hot. He can't get out. He can't do it. He can't understand why he can't get the lock open. So he tries again and then he just collapses on the floor, defeated. And as he leans on the door, the door opens And that's because the door was never locked in the first place. It was only locked in his mind. Brilliant. And we do that all the time, don't we? We put restrictions on ourselves in our minds. So we need to lose our minds. Excellent. (laughs) And mindfulness and meditation can get us there. It can indeed. Gets us out of our minds. You're I right. agree. Yeah, it's well, we do, we just invent stuff, don't we? That that gets in our way. We do, we do. But I'm sure over the coming weeks or months, you and I will be sharing more bits and pieces and things that we learn and know work very well. We will, won't we? We got a lot. We got a lot to teach. We have and a lot to get out there. So that is our mission. It is indeed. But thank you, Alan, for today and uh, taking welcome. this time to share a bit about yourself and how powerful mindfulness has been for you. And uh, we'll, we'll be back again soon. Absolutely. We will be back again soon. So stay tuned for Lose Your Mind. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
拜拜。Bye bye bye.